Marit Ingeborg Lange. Uh, Marit is a distinguished Norwegian art historian with a specialization in 19th century painting. For a number of years, she served as chief curator and head of the Department of Painting and Sculpture at the National Gallery in Oslo. Uh, in this capacity, she was the organizer of a number of exhibitions and at the same time published a number of books. Uh, she, uh, among her many exhibitions, uh, but not at the National Gallery, was the uh, Petter Balka exhibition, which was presented in Tromsø, which you've heard about several times, and then again, another version at the National Gallery, for which she served as co-curator. Um, it's a great pleasure to have her now. She is one of the foremost experts on Balka and is currently working on a monograph, and I'm sure she is going to have a great deal to say to us. Please welcome Marit Longa. Hello. Um... I lost my um, glasses on the airport in Oslo when I left. Uh, so now I have reading glasses on, which means that I could read if I had something to read from. <laughs> but, but um, and I can see you, which is very good in this the situation. So I think I would like to start with a little story for uh, Carl Johan who spoke so nicely about Falkrans. As a matter of fact, uh, Peter Balke was his pupil for some years. Well, uh, Balke was not a regular pupil. He came and went and learned what he wanted to learn. He was a very decisive man in that matter. And um, he criticized once a painting by Falkrans. Falkrans had painted a huge painting, a view from Christiania, that is Oslo, towards the castle, Akershus Castle. And Balke said, how come, Mr. Falkrans, that the waves far out in, in the bay are so big? The distance from where we stand, they should be much smaller and the waves in the front should be bigger. That's normal perspective, Balke said. He didn't know very much about perspective, I would say, but still, <laughs> um, he, he took a chance. And then uh, Falkrans answered, this painting must be regarded as symbolic. The Norwegians are a stubborn people and quarrel in, at every distance. So, the waves were a symbol of, of um, uh, the Norwegian folk, the Norwegians at that time, which, uh, as a matter of fact, we, uh, it was a big political struggle exactly in those years, where the Swedish Norwegian, uh, Swedish Dan uh, Dan Swedish Norwegian king. Uh, tried to uh, to get more power than the constitution had allowed him to have. So that much for Falkrans and his education. Um, oh, Peter Balkin painted. Uh, has a, he had a huge uh, collection. I mean. It, People have asked me, how many paintings do you think he, he painted in all? Well, it's impossible to say, but there are constantly new ones are popping up. And when I say 500, 700, 1,000, well, I stop saying anything, because he has a huge production. But one shouldn't believe that when you have seen this collection you have seen today, because we see the paintings, the same paintings all over again. And I'm sorry, you're going to see them once more here. <laughs> well, then, what shall I then do? Shall I point something? Yeah. Well, I would like just to start with, very quickly, show uh, paintings, uh, more or less chronologically, of Balke, without many comments. And um, then afterwards, we will have a closer look on the, his so-called background, what that is. Well, uh, you have already seen this painting. It's from uh, 
1831, and was one of four paintings that the Swedish king uh, ordered, hmm. bought. <laughs> and uh, from the young artist. Uh, Balke came to uh, Stockholm in uh, 29 and remained there uh, until 33, but uh, he went back and forth. He didn't constantly study under Falkrans, that is for sure. And uh, he, he used, as we uh, use the word, perhaps also in English, the, uh, horses of the apostle, namely his l f legs. His f he walked from Christiania to Stockholm over the mountains back and forth. And he is uh, the Norwegian painter who has done most, uh, I would say, mountain climbing and foot walking in the Norwegian history of art. And uh, here he climbed this wall, which was uh, this road, which was newly built. And of course, it was to flatter the king, the king uh, Karl Johan, for this new road, which combined Nor the Norwegian capital, Christiania, and uh, Stockholm. Uh, it was uh, the only road who, who was by, by, by land to combine, to make it more easy to transport both people and goods by land. Or else, as you know, transportation went by sea in the, those days. And uh, you couldn't, wouldn't say it was very, it's, it's not a very flattering picture, but here we have another painting. So I will do this very quickly. Here you see perhaps what I wanted to tell you, that the brownish color is uh, not only due to bad reproductions, but also uh, due to reality. This is a late one. Uh, Knut Jögo tried to, uh, to date it to the 1860, 1860s, I think I would say 1850. Well, we can quarrel about that later. <laughs> <coughs> well. And as you the quickest of you, of course, have noticed that there, here we have seen lighthouse number two. And of course, we are here in uh, a subject that uh, was very much used by the romantic painters. And uh, it has a very long history, uh, the lighthouse symbolic symbolism in art. And of course, it's very obvious. It's, uh, it's there lightening up to, to make you find the right way in difficult situations. And also, literary, it's very good to have a lighthouse when you are out on sea. And it just in these years, there was a development in the technology of lighthouse lightning. And Norway, was very proud of uh, that they, for the first time in history, was leading on this technological development. We had the long coast, so it was very important, of course. This is a painting from 49, painted for the Swedish Norwegian crown prince. Hello. Uh, 49, here we are in 42. And especially uh, another subject uh, which you see very often, the silent sea and the moon and also a monument here uh, showing that we 
this is a historical landscape where people have lived for thousands of years. Excuse me. <clears throat> so here we are over um, to a new uh, subject or new motives. Balke didn't paint many Northern Light paintings, but some. And probably he didn't see very much many modern Northern Light. Um, not see, he didn't see much more, uh, lightning when he was there. But he could, of course, have seen it all over in Norway later on. And of course, he studied books on the matter. He, Balke visited uh, the northern part of Norway during summer, the summer of, of 32. And so very many of his paintings uh, called um, Midnight Sun is really moonlight. Yes. <laughs> this painting, small painting here, very big for the occasion, and uh, is one of the series he painted for Louis Philippe in 47. The French King Louis Philippe ordered a series of paintings uh, and uh, uh, he looked through, I think it was about 54 paintings, and uh, then chose 33. And of those 33, 26 uh, have remained. Six have got lost during the years. But uh, here you see the simplicity is that we uh, combine with his later things, his later small paintings from, from the 60s and 70s. But he's already here in the 40s and also the tendency to monochromy. But as you also notice, the brushwork are uh, much uh, more uh, traditional here than in his later works, which we saw, for instance, in, in the um, uh, Northern Light painting. And he, this is also from uh, the series of paintings uh, by, from 47 for the French king. Uh, this is a natural form called, oh? Stappen, this one. It was, Morten, didn't you call this that a lighthouse once? You did. Well, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, a natural form uh, and and here, which I think is so fascinating, and why we have to put these un undated paintings from the the Wadehus Festning and Wadde uh, Fyrtorn, which is not Wadde Fyrtorn, but anyhow the lighthouse on Norwegian coast, is this red strip here. Because this painting is dated, and it's not only 47. Most probably it is... January or February 47, because these paint, uh, series of paintings were delivered by uh, Balke to the king and they were freshly painted. I saw these paintings in 77, I mean some years ago, and the people at Louvre didn't know where they were, so we were searching for uh, they were registered, so they knew it. They, it was they had to be somewhere. So they were looking in cupboards, in in uh, all over, and finally on the bottom we found these beautiful small paintings. And when you open them, they came. Each painting was like this, you know, in a book, like that and you opened it up, and then it was thin paper 
covering the, the work of art. And when you took off the thin paint layer of paper, you could see the marks of paint still there. So when Balke closed it, the painting was still wet. So closer a date one cannot come, I would say. And that's very helpful because in Balke's case, he, he, he is very, very seldom he find paintings dated, especially the, in his later peri period. Well, now I'm, I, you have to throw me out here, from here because I don't know what time it is. Well, well <clears throat> no, I very quickly, I hope, uh, not to say anything, just to show you the paintings. Now we'll come to the background. First, we did see various paintings by Balke from different uh, periods, and we have also concentrated upon those uh, we know the date. We have seen 47, 42, uh, for instance, and 31. This was uh, shown by Carl Johan, I think. Um, it's uh, Dahl's famous winter with a dolmen. Do you know what a dolmen is? Well, there it is. Uh, from a Stone Age uh, burial or memory stone of some sort. And here you also see reminiscences of all the stones surrounding it and also oak trees. This painting Balke saw and and Kalyan, you also quoted uh, from what Balke said about this painting. And that is, as a matter of fact, the only words we have of Balke describing a painting of which he, which he admired. Because Balke wrote his autobiography and it doesn't say in very little about painting at all. And that painting he described, and he wondered how much work he had to do to, to arrive at that stage. And as a matter of fact, he never arrived at that stage. But he, that was not the stage he wanted to arrive to. So, what is this then? <clears throat> this is a painting that Balke saw. He doesn't, he, he doesn't mention it, but I know he saw it because it belonged to the National Gallery of Norway. Very nice word. In, uh, indeed, the National Gallery was started in 36, 37, and it started uh, by a grant of thousand special dollars and not one picture, not one sculpture, and not one house to put that, that, those nothing into. But within half a year, there was an auction in Copenhagen and uh, National Gallery bought 28 paintings. Among these, that was one among the, one of those. And uh, the Danish uh, archaeologist uh, Thompson was mentioned here, and Thoms Thompson did, as a matter of fact, select the works that the Norwegian, the first Norwegian uh, paintings for the gallery. Well, that's another thing. And this is a painting by the uh, Hollandish, Netherlandish painter Mankadang, Jacobus Mankadang. You have heard about him, I guess, all of you. Well, now we have heard about him, and he is a fascinating painter. This, he has painted a series. When I started to work on that, I only knew this one. And I, by chance, I, I found another one in another museum with the same figures in. And they are traveling, they are having a nice uh, Sunday uh, walk in the mountain. Here they are fishing, and in the last one they are drinking, and w the woman probably had drunk too much. She's lying there. So you can follow them in four paintings. 
and uh, and uh, uh, you see his the way he he Mankadang uses the paint here. And you see the brown here in the foreground, which is stoppled, and also the treatment here is very close to what Palke could do in in the thirties. So he had some sort of alibi when people uh, reproached him for being uh, too sloppy. Well, Mankadang did the same. Here is another one, Etstorf. Uh, probably this is from Iceland. It might just as well be from the Norwegian coast. But uh, Etstorf was the artist that Balke admired, and he saw him when, as soon as he came to uh, Copenhagen, to Stockholm in uh, uh, 30, uh, 29. And here is another uh, cliff of painted by Christian Etzdorf, uh, German, at that time uh, staying in Stockholm, and a favorite of the Danish, the Swedish Norwegian king. Just for the scale, you see. Oh. Hmm. What is this? Just for the scale, you see the figures there. So it's this is a, a, a form, but of na from nature, of nature. I just wanted to show you this also by Edstorf to show that uh, the Christian, the Karl Johans Kleve is a grayish. Uh, color and and these huge stone masses. He also could. Was that for me? <laughs> uh, here, uh, <laughs> they did not fall down from the cliff. Now we are in France. Uh, as I said, we should go into the background. It's very easy to say. Uh, the, the French Romanticism and German Romanticism uh, lies behind uh, paintings, Balkis paintings from these years. It's very easy to generalize, but we can also be more specific because we know he mentioned Edstorf. He knows that he went to specifically to see those paintings by Edstorf, and he mentions Isabe, which we see here, and which we are going to see later, Gudin, uh, because in a, an article written by uh, our dear poet uh, Vergeland, Vergeland quotes and says that Balke is going, uh, he's now going to, to uh, France. And also, he is going to uh, to study marine paintings like uh, the ones of Isabel eh, and uh, Gudin. So we know, of course, uh, Vergeland was not a specialist in uh, French painting, so he had heard about uh, he had heard those two names by the painter himself. Well. Now we get back again. You can probably see that these people are not very happy there. And here there are no people left. <laughs> and these are, of course, very common subjects, and we don't have to explain why. You know, it's, it's dangerous to stay alive. Uh, this is also Isabel, and if something could remind a little bit about Balke's way of treating paint, it must be paintings like this. But Balke probably did not see this painting. It's as you may perhaps see here. It's 50. 
So then Balke had left France a long time ago. So it is the high romanticism of the 30s which is so important for, for Balke and his subjects. Here is another one by Isabel. Now, Lighthouse again. Uh, this is Gudin, the old Frenchman. And there is also one thing to, to remember here, that they are the same age as uh, Balke. Gudin is born in uh, 1803 and uh, Isabel in 1802, something like that, and they live until the 80s. But none of them developed in uh, Balke's way. I don't have to say so much, but look at the strokes here and think of Balke's. These are put on, on with a fine pencil, not a broad brush. And finally, another light, another Aurelius Boralis. This is uh, Gudin. And also made, even if the sky isn't uh, very uh, striking, we also have to have a striking uh, nature element here to make it even more spectacular. And why do we always forget Isadal? He is, after all, the most important of, uh, of, the, of if you should call him background, of, of uh, uh, Balke's background. Balke uh, came visiting him for the first time on uh, Christmas Eve so in uh, 35. Stayed there for a couple of weeks, then went to Berlin, and then went back again to, to Dahl, and stayed there for some months. So the first time he came visited uh, Dahl, in Dresden was also in was in thirty five to six, and he returned uh, from forty four to forty five, and later on, uh, in uh, from forty seven to forty nine about, very important years in Volker's life. But here now we are going for for the subjects, the motives, and of course. Shipwrecks were on uh, a la mode in these years. And it's, of course it was not because it was very popular to get wrecked, but because it was uh, reality. And as I mentioned, the Norwegian, and all, all Norwegian at least know, the Norwegian coast is terribly long and needed terribly many uh, lighthouses. And uh, in, I think I counted once these shipwrecks uh, in Dahl's oeuvre and among, from about 20, 1820 to 35, 36, uh, he, he painted more than 40, I think. And then it suddenly stopped. It was a, a subject that was on the, had its, reached its peak about 30. If that does give you any sense. <clears throat> Very bad these uh, pictures. Can you can you see them? I, as I told you, I have my reading glasses on, so I can. Them, but are they misty? They are terrible. Old slides. Let's go for old slides. No, but of course I wanted to tell you that there are lucky people over here. But you can't see that. Mm. 
they are managing to, to not only that it's a boat helping them here, uh, but they are also, you know. But here, well, he has this dog. For you, but where should they go? <laughs> we hope there will be uh, something up there. <laughs> oh, it's nothing to laugh about. It's, it's a tragic scene. <laughs> but luckily, here people, well, it's wrecked. But we are five, we are sort of, we have survived and we are corn and we can live on. That's, that's uh, Dahl's more positive point, uh, view of life. And we are all, we are, we are I'm presenting these uh, paintings just to, I must remind you, this is a background. We are now, looking for what Balk has seen, what he has chosen to, to, to use. And of course, these uh, townscapes where you can see uh, only the silhouettes of the town and under moon, under moonlight and the moonlight reflecting in the river. That is his favorite scheme for towns. <clears throat> the first one was Copenhagen. Here we are in Dresden. And what Dahl very often does is that he's, he's making a di diagonal. And where, as you will see in uh, Friedrich's paintings, you will find them much more horizontal. Diagonal. Here, yeah, and then closing here. A scheme you will find very often. Uh, here is another one. Uh, his contemporary uh, uh, family. He was the uh, same age. They didn't know each other well, but they knew of each other, and both were pupils of Dahl. Uh, and uh, we have already been presented to Friedrich and his lonely tree by uh, Asher, who, who did show the uh, similarity of, of uh, Friedrich's lonely tree with Dahl's oak tree and a dolmen. <coughs> And this is a mighty painting, I think. What do you think? It's not a big painting. You know how big is it? Like this? No, small. A, a small painting can be so big, it's very strange. Uh, it, uh, we, we showed it in, uh, at the National Gallery in Oslo in um, 1980. And uh, that little painting could have a wall by itself. It's just so impressive. And what is it? What, what is it that makes it so impressive? You know, Friedrich made that that Balkan never could because he could not fill a marine painting with absolute silence. Uh, for, his, for him, it had to be emotion. So there are two different sides of marine paintings. Oh, here you have, my goodness. This is also a small painting. I'm sure you have seen it in the National Gallery. It's this. No, that is a strange thing, you know. This is from March 47. So here you see the king, Louis Philippe. Ah, oh, no. 
Louis Philippe, I am no. Louis Philippe, his companion, making a fire. <laughs>